Okay, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, thank you for joining us today for the first session of our webinars this week on the heat networks metering and billing regulations. My name is Ryan and I'm a senior compliance officer for the heat networks team in OPSS. Now, before we start, I'm going to do the introductions, go through some housekeeping and explain how the webinar will run. Apart from myself, there are several other colleagues from the OPSS and a base sitting on the production side. Tom, our enforcement team leader, will take you through the presentation today and Nora and Michael will help answer questions alongside with Tom and myself. And we also have a couple of colleagues, Georgina and Alex, who are helping us with the administration side. So for the webinar, once I finish the housekeeping, I'll hand over to Tom for the general heat networks metering and billing presentation. And after that, we'll do the Q&A. We'll take the questions in written form. There is a Q&A tab on the top right corner where you can post questions anonymously if you wish or with your details. If you want to ask the same question that someone else has already posted, please like their question. We'll try and answer the questions with the most likes first. Um, we will try to answer as many questions as we can, but um, if there are some questions that we need to double check or can't answer on the spot, or if we simply run out of time, we'll be sure to pick those up after the session. We'll answer them and circulate a Q&A post-webinar document, though this might take a little time. <clears throat> the session is recorded, but the recording will only include the production side of things, so you don't have to worry about being recorded. The recordings will be made available for all attendees who wish to rewatch the session and for those who simply couldn't catch it today. We'll be aiming to finish the webinars at around three o'clock today, and that is all for me. I'll now hand over to Tom for the presentation. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. So, as Ryan said, um, my name is Tom. I'm Thomas Penson. I am the enforcement team leader for in OPSS for the heat network metering and billing regulations. Um, today, I'm going to talk us through just a bit of background about the regulations. Um, just as a starting block for our series of webinars throughout the week. So later in the week and next week, we've got other sessions, which I hope some of you have signed up for. So we've got a session on building classes and the cost effectiveness test. Next Monday, we've got a session on um, meter installation, and then we find we've got a session on meter accuracy. So hopefully you can all join us for those sessions as well. Um, can I have the first slide, please? So in today's session, um, we are going to look at a variety of things. So we're going to start looking at the definitions under the regulations um, and how to identify networks. Then we're going to look at the requirements and duties of um, heat suppliers on, on networks, um, the installation requirements on those networks and the ongoing requirements relating to meters on networks as well. Um, we're also going to have a look at the billing requirements as well. So we're going to cover all the all the major parts of the regulations and um, we're going to look at some of the key dates under the regs and then we're going to look at the enforcement and compliance elements of the regulations. Can I have the next slide, please. So first off, what is a heat network, please? Um, a heat network is a system that distributes hot water or steam to customers for the purposes of heating um, and it can it, heating or hot water or chilled water for the purposes of cooling um, it needs to be a wet based system so it needs to use water or steam or any other method such as that and this needs to emanate from a central location such as a boiler or chiller throughout a set of pipe work to be delivered to final customers there needs to be that concept of shared heating between different paying customers that um, with the heat coming from that central source there are certain things that um, we don't consider to be a heat network. So an individual boiler in a home that sends heating around uh, a single household would not be a heat network, for example, um, or heating or cooling that's transferred by another method other than heated or chilled liquids. So examples of this includes VRF or um, VRV systems, which are generally air conditioning systems or any other air conditioning systems out there um, because the transfer medium for these is a um, system other than hot water. Um, the, the other concept that I mentioned is around having final customers and paying customers. So any heating system that comes from a central source but only only applies to communal areas of buildings or to um, non-paying customers wouldn't be considered as a heat network. Um, can I have the next slide please? So 
in the regulations, there are two types of heat network that we talk about. Um, there are um, communal networks and district networks. So a communal network is a single building that has two or more final customers, and it needs those two or more final customers to fall within the scope of the regulations. So your typical example of this would be a block of flats that has a single boiler um, or a shop that has a flat above it that's rented out to a variety of people. Um, the other type of network that we talk about are district networks. These are generally your larger networks. So these are multiple building networks. And for those to be within scope, they only require one or more final customer across the entirety of the network. Um, so this could be um, a citywide municipal heating system. Um, so an extremely large network or an entire university or hospital campus that has combinations of types of buildings, or it could just be as small as two or more houses or two or more sheds or barns that share a boiler where some of that is rented out to a separate person. Um, so the heat network regulations capture quite a large um, variety of different end users and different um, heat suppliers and different types of network. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, so what are the different entities that we talk about on the Network. So I've, I've already mentioned some of these these both already. So we've got heat suppliers and final customers. So the heat supplier is the, re is the regulated entity under these regulations. So this might be um, this might be a business that supplies heat to final customers, where they buy buy fuel or heat from another source, um, collect payments, and transfer that heat to the customers on their network. Um, they may also have the authority to fit meters on that network. So a heat supplier in essence can be anyone. It could be the network owner, the operator, the managing agent, a service agent, a local authority, a housing association, it could be a residence association. Um, it could be a, a, a single person as well. It, there's a whole variety of people that, that could be heat suppliers. Essentially what we say is when we're looking at it is it's who's responsible for paying for the fuel that that fuels the boiler, who receives the money from the customers, who has that interaction with the people receiving the heat. Um, and the people to have the interaction with is the final customers. So a final customer is someone who purchases that heating or hot water for their own consumption from a heat supplier. Um, they need to have in, in a residential setting, they need to occupy their own living space. So they need to have their own living sleeping space with sanitary facilities and cooking facilities. So um, for this reason, an entity such as um, a HMO, a house of multiple occup occupation, wouldn't fall under the regulations because they would have shared facilities generally. Um, and also certain um, student accommodations would have shared facilities, which would mean they wouldn't fall under these regulations. Um, if it's a commercial customer, they'd need to have their own partition space, so like a shop or an office space. Um, shared or open spaces wouldn't fall under the final customer definition because there wouldn't be a sectioned off partitioned area where they could, um, where you could feasibly meter their supply and look at the supply that they're getting. So any entity apart from the heat supply themselves could fall under the final customer definition. So a heat supplier can't be a final customer to itself, but any other entity um, that is on that network or part of that network could be a final customer of that heat supplier. Can we have the next slide, please? So, so a couple more definitions for you. So we talk about metering devices in these regulations. There's two main types of metering device we talk about. So it's the heat meter and the heat cost allocator. Um, so the meter, metering device, the heat meter that we talk about is the instrument that's designed to measure, memorize, and display the consumption of heating or cooling or hot water. Normally, when we refer to a heat meter, we're talking about um, the device that calculates the thermal energy um, used. It measures the flow rate of the transfer um, fluid and then measures the change in temperature to calculate how much thermal energy has been used. Generally, when we talk about heat meter, we're referring to final customer meters, but there are also heat meters such as building level meters, which are designed um, to go at the entry points to buildings on um, district networks. Um, but generally, when we say heat meter, we're talking about that final customer meter that goes uh, at the point of entry to a final customer's space or dwelling. Um, and that is to measure the exact consumption of that particular customer. Um, there are various standards that um, can apply to heat meters, and we'll talk about those slightly later in the week. But in general, 
um, under the regulations, heat ne meters need to accurately measure, memorize and display the consumption of the heat used by that final customer. Um, and as I said, we've got further discussions happening later this week and next week around meters um, in these webinars, which hopefully you'll be able to join us for. Um, the second type of metering device that we mentioned in the regulations is a heat cost allocator. So these are small devices, um, slightly smaller than your average phone would be nowadays, and they um, are welded onto the side of a radiator and they measure um, energy com consumption um, using um, a different method. So they measure the difference in temperature from the radiator to the room and do an allocation um, across the network of how much heat has been used or drawn from that radiator to heat it. So you need one of these devices on every radiator in, in a property if you're using a heat cost allocator as a way of um, defining how much heat someone's used. Um, where you install a heat cost allocator, you're also required to install um, a hot water meter and a thermostatic radiator valve. So the thermostatic radiator valve is to ensure that the final customer actually has the ability to modulate the temperature in their property and change the temperature. And the hot water meter is there to measure any hot water they're using or being supplied from the network. Obviously, if they're not being supplied hot water for, for use, then um, you would need to install a hot water meter. Um, and again, these, these heat cost allocators are installed in instances where it's not feasible or cost effective to install your traditional heat meters. So it's not, tr it's not an either or choice that you can install a heat meter or you can decide to install a heat cost allocator. Heat cost allocators only really come into play if it's already been established. It's not technically feasible or cost effective to install meters. And again, we're going to talk delve more into those terms later in the week. Can I have the next slide, please? So how do you identify what a heat network is? So to identify an in-scope heat network, the following things should be considered. So are the people or the tenants on that network being supplied heating, cooling or hot water from a central source? Um, and then if they are, you can think about, so what is the sort of shared system that's being operated? Is it a communal network or is it a district network? There are slightly different rules for communal networks and district networks when we come to the building classes part of the of the week. But in general, um, they're all subject to the same um, conditions. Um, so to define whether it's communal or district, the simple ways of looking at is how many buildings does it have? If there's only one building in the network, it's going to be a communal network. If it's got more than one building, it's a district network. And then to establish whether that network's in scope, you've got to look at the number of customers. So a communal network requires two or more final customers in, in that single building, and a district network requires one or more final customer. As long as you meet, the, meet those requirements, meet those levels, then it's going to be within scope of the regulations. Finally, you need to look at whether there's actually a transaction between the heat supplier and the final customer. So this is this can be a bit tricky sometimes and it can be a bit of an odd definition, but it's required under the regs to make sure it's in scope. If there's no customers on the network, then it's not going to be in scope of the regulations. So this charge can either be a direct charge, a named charge for heat saying that you have paid X amount directly for your heat supply or it could be an indirect charge so it could be a service charge that's applied or a maintenance charge or it could be rolled up as part of rent if the the heat is included or the utilities are included in that payment and um, then there would be an indirect charge for the heating um, and either of those would be a situation where you create a final customer on your network and um, can I have the next slide please So we've identified what heat, what we think um, a final customer is. So we're now going to look at the heat supplier side of things. So the heat supplier, in some instances, um, can be difficult to identify who the heat supplier is. In some instances, it's relatively straightforward. So generally, the heat supplier is the entity that's responsible for supplying the heat to the final customers and charging the, the final customers for their heat. Um, and this can include any entity involved in management of a building. Um, there's a list of examples on the page that I'm not, not going to read through, um, and there's many more that we could put on there. It, essentially, the, the final customer is going to be the, the person or the entity that has the responsibility from the customers to provide the heat. So they would be the indications for us to, to show that would be they would be pe people receiving the monies, paying the bills that, um, that for the fuel that 
he feeds the boiler um, responsible for maintenance would be a good example um, responsible for in the installation of meters or having the ability to install meters um, or having just simply having a contract in place between the customer and this entity um, in some instances they may not cover all of those bases but we can get a good idea of who the heat supply is going to be by looking at those types of examples and those um, indicators the big one when I when I look at it is who's paying for the heat, who's paying for the fuel for the boiler and who's receiving the money in receipt of the heat. Um, so they're, they're the big indicators for us. Um, can I have the next slide, please? So the, the scenarios where it gets a bit more tricky to identify a heat supplier, um, we, we have this term called cascading responsibilities. So the idea of this is you could have um, a network within a network essentially. So if you have a larger district network that feeds multiple buildings, um, they could feed um, they could feed a building and have a contract with the um, managing agent on that building, and then that managing agent may recharge that heat onto the tenants or the residents within that building. In that instance, we'd, we'd say we'd have a cascading responsibility network. So we have the larger district network and then we have a smaller network. Um, so that managing agent in the middle is not only a final customer of the larger network, they are a heat supplier of that smaller network. And as a heat supplier of that smaller network, they would still have all the responsibilities that a heat supplier would have um, in terms of completing notification forms, um, completing cost effectiveness tools where required and installing meters and then billing correctly according to the regulations. Um, in our experience so far, we found that um, cascading networks are most commonly found on local authority or housing association properties um, or on those sort of networks. Um, and there's a quote there from our guidance. So where a heat supplier supplies and charges heat to a housing association, then passes the heat and charges it on to the tenants. These are two two heat networks because there are two heat supplier and final customer arrangements in place. The first between the heat supplier and the housing association, while the second is between the housing association and the tenants. And if we go to the next slide, please. Um, here is a visual example of what I was talking about. So we've got a wider district network from that central source of heat, which is supplying the three buildings that we've got in place here. And in that second building, it's supplying it to the building owner B, and then that building owner is recharging it back to the other customers within the building. So you can see there's two distinct networks. There's one larger district network indicated by the larger circle, and then there's that secondary communal network indicated by that smaller circle. And in this case, Person A would be a heat supplier of the larger network. Person B would be a final customer of the larger network, but also a heat supplier of the smaller network. And then C and D would just be final customers in this instance. It can get a get bit complicated. Um, and if you do have any um, examples like this or questions around areas such as this, I do recommend you get in contact with us to discuss it because they can be a little bit tricky and untangling sometimes. Um, but um, as I said, this this example and um, some um, further wording around this is available in our guidance document. Um, can I have the next slide, please? So what are the heat suppliers requirements under the regulations? So I've mentioned already we've got the duty to notify, we've got the duty to install meters, we've got the ongoing requirements for meters and we've got the um, requirements around billing. So I'll start at the beginning and we're going to work our way through. So the first one we're going to look at is regulation three, which is the duty to notify. So all heat suppliers must notify um, OPSS about um, any heat networks they operate. So this is a requirement that's been in place since the start of the regulations in 2014. So we've gone through a couple of cycles of this now. So heat suppliers must submit a new notification at least every four years. And um, if you notified us when the regulation first came into force, um, then the first re-notification would have been during 2019. Um, if a heat supplier has failed to notify us, then we recommend that you notify us as soon as possible to rectify any non-compliance with the regulations because we will be looking for any incomplete or incorrectly filled out notifications or any that we're just missing um, from our original data and they, they do get ch chased up. We will be chasing up in the future as well. Um, a template is available on our website 
which must be used by heat suppliers when completing the notification. Um, and there's a link to our website there. So it's www.gov.uk forward slash heat dash networks. Um, and to submit the notification, you have to submit it to that email address there, which is heat notifications at bays.gov.uk. This is also the same email address that we recommend you contact us if you do have any queries or questions um, about your net about any networks or about anything to do with the regulations. Um, there is currently a um, temporary gap on the submission of notifications. So if your notification was due between the 27th of November 2020 when the amendments came in up until the 1st of September this year, then you don't have to submit your notification until that 1st of September date. This was to allow heat suppliers to generate the extra information that's now required on the notification template. If your notification was due before that before the 27th of November 2020, then it is still due now and we would urge you to get it in as soon as possible if you haven't done so already. If your notification is due after that date, then um, the normal rules will apply. If you've started a new network in that time, then um, the abatement doesn't apply and your notification will be due as soon as your network goes live. So again, in that instance, uh, I would urge you to get in contact with us as soon as possible. Um, can I have the next slide, please? So this is what I was just talking about, the transitional period. So just to reiterate, if your um, notification was due in um, between the 27th of November 2020 and the 1st of September 2022, then there was this transitional arrangement in place to collect that extra data and your notification would be due in after the 1st of September 2022. As I said, if your notification was due in before that, the start of that period, then it's not affected by the transitional period and it is still due in and we would urge you to do it as soon as possible. Can I have the next slide, please? So what are the other, the next requirements under the regulation? So regulation four is the duty to install meters. So this is the big one at the moment because there is a deadline coming up on the 1st of September 20 this year for heat supplies to install meters where required. Um, so as part of this, there's a concept of building classes, which is new under the amendments. And as I said, um, later this week, we'll be talking in more detail about building classes. So if you do have any questions around building classes, I, I would encourage you to um, attend that session. So the three different building classes are the viable class, the open class and the exempt class. So for any buildings that fall into the viable class, heat suppliers must install final customer meters in, in these buildings. There isn't a question about this. It is something that has to be done. Generally, a viable class building is a, a new building, um, but as I said, we will go into more detail in this later in the week. Um, I'm, I'm going to skip over the open class for a second and just talk about the exempt class. So um, the exempt class, um, is a, there's certain requirements to meet the exempt class. The exempt class doesn't mean you're exempt from the entirety of the regulations. It just means you, that the building is exempt from the meter installation part of the regulations. Um, in these buildings, if you fall in, if your buildings falls into the exempt class, you don't need to install meters or complete a cost effects from this tool or install any metering devices. Um, there are a certain set of exemptions, which I'm not going to go into detail today. They will be they will be looked at in more detail later in the week. Um, for buildings that do that don't fall into the viable or the open class, um, in, oh, sorry, into the viable or the exempt class, they will fall into the open class. So for any buildings that fall into the open class, um, heat suppliers must install meters um, for each final customer, unless it's not technically feasible or cost effective to do so. So there is a list of technical feasibility arguments in the regulations. Uh, it's a very narrow list, um, but the other part of this is the cost effectiveness argument. Um, the, to determine the if it is cost effective, um, there is a tool that has been created which is available on our website um, and the outcome of this cost effectiveness tool determines whether meters need to be installed or not. Um, and as it says there, the obligation to install meters is dependent on the outcome of the cost effectiveness tool. If the tool is negative and you don't need to install meters, then heat supplies will be required to retest once every four years um, to reflect any changes in the either in the network or in the um, or in the sector, essentially. Um, on district networks, there's an additional requirement. So district networks are required to install building level meters. Um, so these need to be installed at the entry point for every building that is served by that district network that has one or more customer that is being provided heating, cooling or hot water. Again, 
excuse me. Again, this requirement has been in place since the start of the regulations. It's not a new requirement. Um, and it is something that has been, is reported on in the in the um, notification template. There's no considerations around cost effectiveness or technical fe feasibility related to building level meters, so it's something that needs to be done on those district networks. Um, can I have the next slide, please? So um, in addition to the installation requirements for um, for heat meters, there's also the requirements related to heat cost allocators. So um, where there is um, one or more final customers in a building supplied by a heat network and the supplier supplies both heating and hot water to that building and the heat supplier is determined it's not cost effective to, or technically feasible to install meters in accordance with the regulations, then they must determine if it's cost effective to install heat cost allocators, thermostatic radiator valves and hot water meters. Again, this is determined by the cost effectiveness tool, but it is done simultaneously at the same time, so you don't have to repeat the test. Um, what the tool will do, it will tell you if you need to install meters, if you need to install heat cost allocators, or if it's not cost effective to do either. either. And again, if it's determined not to be cost effective to install heat cost allocators as well as meters, then you'll be required to retest once every four years. Um, where it's determined that it's not cost effective to install or technically feasible to comply with regulation four or six so that's the installation of meters or the installation of heat cost allocators a heat supplier may use an alternative method to charge their final customers for heating so this means that um, any method that is currently being used can continue to be used it doesn't need to be done on exact consumption data can I have the next slide please so the next slide is the ongoing requirements. And again, we, we have got a webinar on this coming up later in the week. Um, in fact, I think next week um, where we'll look at this in a lot more detail. So I'm only going to cover the basic points. So regulation five relates to metering and says that heat supplies must ensure that meters accurately measure, memorize and display the consumption of heating, cooling or hot water by the final customers. Um, any meters installed from the date of the amendments, the 27th of November 2020, must comply with this requirement from the moment the meter is installed. Any meters installed prior to the 27th of November must comply from this before the 1st of September 2022. So from the 1st of September 2022, essentially, all meters need to make sure that they are um, accurately measuring, memorizing and displaying the consumption of heating, cooling and hot water by the final customers. Um, and Regulation 8 relates to the ongoing obligations um, relating to both meters and heat cost allocators. And it simply says that, they, that suppliers must ensure that they are continually operating correctly and that they're properly maintained and periodically checked for errors. So this just means that as part of the ongoing maintenance of the network, you need to make sure that the meters that have been installed on that network continue to work as intended um, and that they are maintained and and checked that they're not working incorrectly. OK, can the next slide, please? Um, the final part of the ongoing um, requirements is the replacement of meters. This is regulation seven. So um, heat supplies must ensure that any replacement meter follows the same requirements that it accurately measures, memorizes and displays the consumption of heating, cooling or hot water by a final customer. Um, and there are instances where a heat supplier doesn't need to comply with the above, so it doesn't need to replace any existing meters, and that's where it would be technically impossible to replace those meters, or um, it's determined that the estimated cost would be unreasonable. So um, any evidence of it being technically impossible or an unreasonable cost would need to be provided to OPSS um, for this reply, and then we would look at this on a case-by-case -case basis to determine whether we agree or don't agree. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? So the final part of this is around billing requirements. So um, this comes under regulation nine and schedule two in the regulations. Um, so where meters are installed, heat suppliers um, must ensure that the, the bills and the billing information they provide to their customers are accurate based on actual consumption and compliant with schedule two. 
So what Schedule 2 does, it, it specifies the minimum requirement for bills and billing purposes. So this includes the frequency, the breakdown of those bills and any exemptions on those bills that apply as well. And um, the amendments introduced, introduced a number of um, exemptions to billing requirements, and these exemptions largely follow the contents of the exempt building class. Um, can I have the next slide, please? So for bills, bills need to be issued and at least annually. Any variable charges calculated from a final customer meter needs to be in kilowatt hours, and any fixed charges need to be specified. Um, the billing information that goes alongside the bills needs to be issued at least biannually or quarterly if you're using um, electronic billing or at any time the customer requests it. It must include the current energy prices, um, the information about the customer's energy consumption. Where available, it needs to include a year on year comparison of the consumption data. And it also needs to include any con a, a contact for an organisation that promotes energy efficiency. So this is to encourage the customers on the networks to use less energy and save heat, essentially. Can I have the next slide, please? OK, this is the key date. So this is the, the reason why we've organised these um, webinars really is to talk about this date. So from the 1st September 2022, um, all of the obligations that are written into the regulations become become an offence and it will become an offence not to comply with these regulations in their entirety. So essentially heat suppliers have got until the 1st September 2022 to make sure that um, any notifications um, that are due have been provided, any cost effectiveness tools um, that need to be submitted uh, have been submitted. Any meters that need to be installed or any heat cost allocators that need to be installed have been installed and that they're billing um, their customers based on those, the readings from those devices. Um, after this date, um, OPSS will be in a position where we can look at some of the areas of this regulations and carry out enforcement action if, if required. Can I have the next slide, please? So, um, as I said, the Office of Product Safety and Standards, so that's us, OPSS, we are the authorised person responsible for enforcing these regulations. And the various activities we do to do to do this um, are um, we raise awareness and do heat supplier engagement in events such as this. Um, we respond to complaints from both the public and from customers and um, relating to heat networks and also um, respond to calls for advice or queries on how to be compliant from heat network operators and also organisations that work closely with um, heat network operators or um, represent um, heat suppliers. Um, we would recommend that um, any heat supplier who identifies any element of non-compliance does contact us as soon as they notice it. Um, we, we are not a punitive um, regime. We're not looking to punish people. We're looking to work with you to make sure that we can resolve any non-compliance. So engagement is key um, when we're looking to resolve any, any non-compliance that becomes apparent. Um, and we will always try and engage with heat suppliers before we consider any further actions that we need to do. Um, can I have the next slide, please? So how do we go about our enforcement activities? So when reviewing non-compliance, we always we will always consider how um, productive and timely the engagement has been with the heat supplier. We'll look at the severity of the offence and we'll look at the proportionality of our potential enforcement actions and weigh up all of those options before we decide what we want to do. Um, so we're, we're able to, um, as enforcement actions available to us, um, issue compliance notices, um, enter into enforcement undertakings, and if compliance can't be achieved for either of these actions, then we can look to issue non-compliance penalties or fines, um, or, or publish details of non-compliance publicly as well. Um, can I have the next slide, please? So, um, one thing we'll talk about very quickly is just enforcement undertakings. So um, enforcement undertakings are essentially an agreement between us, OPSS and the heat supplier, and it relies heavily on productive and timely engagement. So the enforcement undertaking template will be completed by the heat supplier and, and they will enter into the terms of the undertaking. And essentially it's an agreement between both parties um, where um, non-compliance has been um, acknowledged by the heat supplier and there will be a date put in place um, 
by which that non-compliance needs to be rectified or changes need to be made to step along the way towards rectifying any non-compliance. Um, an enforcement undertaking, it can be modified and have the date changed if it's agreed to by OPSS, but OPSS would expect to see um, some evidence showing why achieving compliance in that agreed time frame wouldn't have been possible. Um, we can also issue compliance notices. So uh, we will issue a compliance notice to a heat supplier and it details what is required to achieve compliance and the time frame that OPSS determines. Um, prior to a compliance notice, a notice of intent will always be sent to inform the heat supplier that um, OPSS intends to issue a notice. Um, heat suppliers can appeal a notice sent by OPSS and the right of appeal will be detailed on that compliance notice. And a compliance notice will be considered when engagement has not been established. So if we if we're struggling to establish that engagement um, with a heat supplier, then compliance notice will be the route that we end up taking eventually, um, especially if that engage any engagement turns to be non productive as well. Um, can I have the next slide, please? So available help. So um, that, that top link is a link to our website. Um, on that website, we have um, so a regulatory guidance document. We have a link to the notification template and a full user guide for the notification template. We have two versions of the cost effectiveness tool, the full and the reduced input tool. And again, these will be talked about in a little bit more detail later in the week and a user guide um, to go alongside that. And we'll also have, we also have links to the regulations and the amendments that have been made. Um, um, not listed here, but we also have um, previous webinars that we have conducted, um, which we have links available for, um, which hopefully will be going on our website in the near future. And we also have a series of YouTube videos which are currently making um, to try and explain uh, in bite sized chunks some concepts under the regulations. <coughs> um, so the first one of these around um, building classes was published a couple of months ago. And if it's something that you're, you're interested in looking at, then if you get in touch with us at that email address, we can provide you with the link to it. But eventually that will event, that will end up on our website as well. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the web, the email address heat notifications at bays.gov.uk. That's our shared inbox email address. Um, it's used for any inquiries regarding the regulations from heat suppliers, customers or any entity any other related entity and it's also used for submitting the notification template or any cost effectiveness tools that you want to submit to us. Um, and then next slide, I think that is the end of this presentation. Yep. So um, thank you for listening to me. Um, I hope you've managed to learn a little bit about heat networks if you didn't know already or it's just solidified anything you knew.